I do want to suggest as I move to maybe a final point of, of our conversation that one of the persuasive lies of either of these perspectives is that the only way to show up to advocate for the kingdom is the ballot box is our, you just mentioned it. Uh, they didn't have that Liberty in the, the new Testament church. They didn't have uh, access to uh, the ballot box, so to speak. And so for us to be hoodwinked or duped into believing that the most important thing we do for the next four years is, uh, you know, check, uh, next to a box of some unlikable rich person um, that that has achieved a political prowess through all manners of the mechanisms of this world, that that's the most important thing we do. We have, I think, emptied the power of, of a longstanding tradition of the church affecting change for the world, even from a posture of powerlessness, but they use the power they did have responsibly. And that's the tradition I want to step into as we, we scramble to find that. So um, if I could pivot to a final question, I want to read, and uh, again, it's a bit of a lengthy quote, so uh, just bear with me for a second, but I just, I, I found every word of it dripping with wisdom. Uh, James Davison Hunter wrote a book called To Change the World. And in, in the book, he he kind of critiques the Christian right, the Christian left, and the neo-anabaptist, you know, the folks that uh, that want to disengage. Um, and uh, he 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 advocates for what he calls a faithful presence within, and he, and and he does that by by talking about what it could look like if we sought a new city commons, is what he called it. So I'm going to outline that idea in a couple of paragraphs and get you guys to respond to it. But I, I guess for me, I, I'm compelled by his challenge to think outside of the political when we're asking this question how do we correlate our kingdom of uh, of, of heaven citizenship with our kingdom of earth citizenship if we thought outside the political what options would be be vibrantly drawn toward in a way that empowers human flourishing uh in a, in a divisive culture so uh let's let's read this uh the ideal is to shift to a post constantinian engagement which means a way of engaging the world that neither seeks domination nor defines identity and witness over and against domination. For most, this will mean coming to terms with the past. Christians must recognize that, uh, uh, that though it clearly benefited in many fundamental and extraordinary ways from people of faith and the good ideals of the Christian tradition, America was never in any theologically serious way a Christian nation, nor the West a Christian civilization. Neither will they become uh, so in the future. The goal for Christians then is not and never uh, has been to take back the culture or to take over the culture or to win the culture wars or to save Western civilization. Ours now, emphatically, in a post-Christian culture and the community of Christian believers are now more than ever spiritually, uh, um, uh, I lost my thought, and the community of Christians uh, believers are now more than ever spiritually speaking exiles in a land of exile. Uh, the Christians, as with the Israelites in Jeremiah's account, must come to terms with this exile. It isn't just the Constantinian temptation that uh, the church must repudiate, but more significantly, the orientation toward power that underwrites it. The proclivity toward domination and toward the politicization of everything leads Christianity today to bizarre turns that uh, turns that, in my view, transform much of the Christian public witness into the very opposite of the witness Christianity is supposed to offer. A, a vision of the New City Commons, rooted in a theology of faithful presence, certainly uh, leads to a repudiation of resentment that defi defines so much of uh, Christianity's con contemporary public witness. Yet it also leads to a post-political view of power. It is not likely to happen, but... It may be that the healthiest course of action for Christians on this count is to be silent for a season and learn how to enact their faith in public through acts of shalom rather than to try again to represent it publicly through law, policy, and political mobilization. This would not mean civic privatism, but rather a season to learn how to engage the world in public differently and better. Your responses, my friends. <laughs> Um, I really love that idea of shalom. Mm. And I think that keeps coming back. And you said that even before reading that quote of what does it look like for us to bring shalom as the people of God? And I think I maybe resist a little bit 
the extreme of we should all be silent for a season. Mm -hmm. Some should probably be silent. Um, this was written in 2010. So interesting. You know, maybe the silence is gone. <laughs> you know? But I, I think like what it's coming to and what it's getting at is truly all of this. I just keep coming back to is what is our motivation? Is our motivation to gain power, or is our motivation to follow the way of Jesus, which is we have no power. We are not doing things in our own strength. We are doing all through his strength and his way is that upside down kingdom. Um, and yeah, there's, um, Lara who is in our church family mm -hmm. a couple years ago, she said something very off the cuff that I have never forgotten. And mm -hmm. she said, you know, the, the world wants me to choose, like, am I going to be on the axis of the radical right or radical left? And she said, I am getting on a totally different axis mm -hmm. that is about the radical love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Rich Velotis said something similar about how um, the church is not to be found at the center of the political world. The church is to be a species of its own kind, confounding left, right, and center, and finding mm. its identity from the center of God's life in Christ. Mm. And I think um, I think that's where we find that pursuing of shalom when we continue to keep our eyes focused on the goal of loving our neighbor as ourselves, but first loving the Lord our God with all our whole heart, soul, strength, that's and right. mind, um, and being centered on him and not in the center of the swirling vortex of our political season that we're in, um, or whatever that is. I mean, if that can go much broader to that. Maybe it's just the swirling vortex of youth sports. Good gracious, that's all encompassing right now. Um, whatever that is, of just remembering like God wants us to be a people of shalom. And if we haven't found that shalom ourselves and we're mm. allowing the political noise to disrupt all of that, we have to, maybe we as individuals do have to step out and be silent for a bit yeah. to find that shalom before we have any of that to offer anyone else. Wow. That's, that's rich. Yeah. 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 Amanda, what, what, what are your thoughts? I think it's C.S. Lewis who says he defines patriotism as love of home. And I, I just think that there's a million ways beyond voting, <laughs> beyond engagement in politics that we can invest in the flourishing of our neighbor. Patriotism, right. according to C.S. Lewis, is a desire to see your neighbor flourish. It's a desire to see your home a place of safety and, and flourishing. Um, are we feeding our neighbor that's hungry? Are we yeah. meeting our neighbors who are new to our community? Are we... Um, are we creating beautiful art? Are we taking care of the trees and the rivers? Are mm -hmm. we, there's a million ways to love our country. Um, and I, and to be patriots. <laughs> uh, and, and I, I think the, the thing I would end on is I, I just think that the cornerstone of Christian virtue is humility. Mm -hmm. We're going through Romans, the latter half of Romans as a church family. It's a book all about these descents, this, these this divide between the Jews and the Gentiles and gosh what kind of story was God telling through the Israelites and what kind of story was he telling through the Gentiles and how are we supposed to graph those stories together um feels kind of familiar right and and I think he Paul begins with humility don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to mm -hmm. um, remember that you're part of one another you are members of one another um if my neighbor's hurting I'm hurting that's how mm -hmm. it ought to be if my um if my fellow citizen is hurting I'm hurting uh and that's how we ought to think that if we could somehow look one another in the eye and and believe that gosh, we're all just wrestling with this. We're all doing the best we can with the circumstances that we're in. We're all trying to use wisdom in how we vote, give one another the benefit of the doubt, and then have robust discourse and robust dialogue with yeah. that humility as the yeah. foundation. Gosh, that would be subversive. Yeah. That would be subversive to a culture that literally uses fear as a marketing scheme. And, and so I think, I think that's what if Christians want to be salt and light in this particular way, in this political realm, let's remember 
just how far humility can take us right. in building bridges towards our neighbor and and frankly settling our own souls and as as Sharon Hottie Miller said caretaking that wellspring of our soul that's right you both have mentioned that i think that's that's important for us to hear as practical uh realities of experiencing shalom and being with god like that it, it, that has to be a part of this uh just just retweeting or comment threading or voting is uh uh, we need to commune deeply with God in order to to affect change in the world. Uh, I'll, I'll add one thing, uh, just a, a theological kind of capstone to this would be the the fact that we're made in the image of God, and it, it's a title that I, it could it, it's hard to exhaust what that meant to the original audience and the different semantic fields of kinship, of kingship, of of uh, of cult image. Uh, don't have time to dive into all that, but what what I the the, the reservation of that. Uh, that language in the ancient world was for kings and this this giving this dignity of rulership. And it, you don't even have to to know that particular backdrop to look at what he he told humanity to do, uh, you know, to exercise dominion. So here's here's what I'm trying to get at. All uh, for, forget the ballot box for a minute. Uh, if if that has become an idol or a distraction, um, for a second, I'm not asking anybody not to vote. I'm just saying, just for a second, let's let's take that off the table. Every Every human action, every human uh, activity is inherently political. It's inherently, it's, it's an exercise of our dominion. So how we treat our neighbor, how we interact online, how we, uh, how we, what products we buy, what, what we do with our time, what we put on our screens, how we parent our children. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to over-individualize this stuff, but the collective weight of the church thoughtfully representing the kingdom in our communities, it does make a difference and it does have an impact. And it is something I, I just, if there's one thing I want folks to hear in this political season is that just please don't buy into the lie that the most important thing you do is to cast a vote for broken people uh, in a broken world. Um, the, the most important thing you can do politically even is living out uh, the, the restored dignity of being in Christ as a human being uh, among human beings and, and to give that vision of new humanity is politically powerful. You are affecting change for the kingdom and it is no small thing. And so I just, uh, to, to, for those that are listening that are younger, that don't have the right to vote yet for those that are, that are disenchanted with the political system or, or whatnot, um, just know that your human activity can reflect the kingdom of God. And, and, and the more that we look like Jesus, the more that kingdom is represented. So uh, hopefully it's an, an encouraging and empowering and non-anxious message in the middle of a fraught season. And that's uh, ultimately what we want to do um, with this table talk is to empower and to lift up and edify. And um, So uh, be encouraged, uh, kingdom representatives, and may we image uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, vibrantly uh, at the ballot box and beyond, and uh, yeah, that we're we're grateful to, to to have this conversation. Thank you so much, Sue Alice. Thank you so much, Amanda, for your wisdom and sharing today. And uh, yeah, may it build up the church. Until next time, Godspeed. <laughs>